Welcome to Poho's Bullpen, where we talk baseball and sometimes a little bit more. I'm your host, Seth Poho, and today I'm talking to the author of the new book by Lion Press, a fine team man, Jackie Robinson and the lives he touched. Joe Cox, author of the book. Welcome to the bullpen. It is a thrill to have you here. Thank you, Seth. Glad to be with you. I, I knew I belonged in the bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, not just anyone can be in the bullpen. You did something quite noteworthy, your new book, which, you know, having read over the last week, in all honesty, I thoroughly enjoyed a fine team, man. I thought it, you did a great job really um, researching and covering all the different lives that were interacting and really touching upon a character in not just American history, but baseball history as well and in history in general Jackie Robinson that really resonates, I think, to a lot of people now as much as it would have back in the 1940s when he did it. And I feel like with me, especially with last week, the passing of Frank Robinson, who you, know, you who I felt kind of had a lot of those same kind of traits that made Jackie a great player and also for Frank a great uh, person and manager. And even looking at some of the race issues our country is dealing with to me, you know, it, it's amazing that you were able to kind of take a, take a person like Jackie Robinson and do so much in-depth work. What really drove you to tackle this subject? Well, as with anything that I end up writing about, it's, it's one of those kind of random flukes of happenstance and opportunity that, that, you know, comes my way. And, uh, I, I, you know, Jackie was always in my mind as, as this kind of, figure beyond all figures in, in American sport and American history. Uh, but, but, you know, there's the challenge of a guy who's this well chronicled and written about, what do you say that adds anything to it? Well, for one thing, I read Doris Kearns Goodwin's A Fine Team Man, or I'm sorry, A Fine Team Man <laughs> is inspired by Doris Kearns Goodwin. I wish she'd written my book. Uh, Team of Rivals, uh, rather. Uh, that's how closely I interrelate the books in my mind. Uh, but I, I read what she did with Lincoln and seeing Lincoln afresh in this relational context. Uh, you know, the story of Lincoln's told and retold. But I felt like I knew him a little bit better when I finished her book just by the way he interacted with these people who were the movers and shakers of his day. Uh, so I kind of took a page out of the same playbook with Robinson and the inspiration for that, I'm washing dishes in my kitchen and I'm listening to an audio book uh, and Red Barber talks about uh, Robinson and how he changed his life forever. And by the end of the, the excerpt I'm listening to, I'm sitting there with tears running down my face in my kitchen and I'm thinking, this is it. If he changed Red Barber this much, there got to be a handful of other people I can do the same thing that, that Ms. Goodwin did with, with Lincoln, with Jackie Robinson. So it's a biography of Jackie Robinson, but in a circular kind of way, in that it looks at these other people who surrounded him while he did the amazing things he did. And some of those stories have been told pretty well, and some of them not much or even not at all. Uh, so, you know, as a secondary thing, you kind of get their story. But you also see Robinson in action. It's It's one thing to talk about the amazing things he did, but it's another thing to see, you know, how the actual give and take of that worked. How did he change these people? How did they support him in his hours of, of need or trouble? Um, and, and I think hopefully it adds something to the overall picture of Robinson, a little bit more dimension in the same way that she did, hopefully, with Lincoln. Well, maybe you'll be lucky. I mean, knowing how much of a big Brooklyn Dodger fan that she is, maybe she will pick up your book and read it. <laughs> I, I would love it. I hope she wouldn't be offended if she did, uh, just because it's it's a hard thing that, that she undertook. Uh, you know, her research is a lot farther back in history than mine, and uh, it, it's it's an interesting way to, to do things. But if I carried it off one-tenth as well as she did, then I'm happy with the end result. Yeah, and in, in, in you mentioning Red Barber, I mean, I was about nine years old when Ken Burns Baseball came out, and... The one thing I love that Ken Burns really did is that, you know, much like what you did with a fine team man, you know, going so deep and trying to find all the research and obviously with him being a, a visual medium, trying to, you know, get these interviews. And he pretty much got Barber towards the back end of his life. You know, he never got to saw that documentary. 
But you know, with with Barber, that the, his interviews in those in in that documentary really resonated with me, much like you mentioned the audio book, and the fact that it shows the flaws of human beings. And the one thing that Burns recently did with his documentary on Jackie Robinson, and what you really did well, I think, in your book was showing that there's this flawed version of Jackie Robinson. You know, growing up, you always get the five minute history course in your school that. You know, Jackie is always depicted, I mean, from the Roman Catholic in me, is he's always depicted as this pure, infallible saint. Mm -hmm. But the way your book really depicts him, especially early on when you talk about Rachel, Jackie is far from a perfect individual. And, and, you know, not just the burden that he had to bear in terms of, you know, integrating the game. He just had a lot of own personal struggles that don't necessarily come to light, and especially in his post-baseball career. What was the one thing that you really dug up about a, something? Monocling his life. Well, you're absolutely right to point that out, and that's one of the things I wanted to avoid, uh, certainly with Lincoln and with Robinson both. There is this tendency to make them these perfect you know, historical martyrs, and and they were men. They had their peccadilloes and their problems just the same as anybody else. Uh, In a big picture scope, I loved telling more stories about Rachel Robinson because you have this profound irony that Jackie Robinson, Mr. Social Change, you know, plays his baseball career and he retires and Rachel says, I want to take that college degree I earned and I want to go out and work a job. And Jackie Robinson completely balks at it. He's he's a, a beacon of progress in regard to the color of your skin, but not so much to your gender. Uh, so Rachel has to kind of teach him in much the same way that he taught a lot of people in 1947. And that was a really fun story to tell. There's a, an anecdote in there I love where Rachel remembered she's taking night classes. She goes back to school. And Jackie's working for Chock Full of Nuts Coffee Company at that point. And he found the the Chock Full of Nuts restaurant that was closest to her class. And he would wait for her after class. So she'd get out of class and she would come find him. And then they would go home together and she would tell him what she had done. And she said that it reminded her of the days with the Dodgers when she would come to Ebbets Field and watch the game and wait for him. And then he'd come out and they'd take a taxi home and he'd talk her through the day's game. So, you know, what what a, an interesting way to see a guy grow and change in regard to his views about women. Um, in the micro view, uh, I love a story that I tell about Ben Chandler, or Chandler Chapman, rather, the uh, manager of the Phillies in there who is infamous for giving Robinson, uh, you know, racial hatred. Uh, a few years into Robinson's career, uh, he's playing a game against, I believe it's Cincinnati, that uh, Chapman's coaching for. And Chapman says something to Pee Wee Reese about Robinson. And Robinson hears it and comes over, and I'm not looking at the quote, but the gist of it is, I had to take this off of you years ago. But today, if you say another word, I'm going to kick your ass. And Reese was the one who told the story, and Reese said Chapman didn't have another word to say. Uh, So, you know, he could be the patient saint when he needed to be, but he wasn't above telling Ben Chapman that, uh, you know, when his ordeal was done, he'd be glad to to meet him and settle matters a little more primally. Well, you know, that kind of brings up an interesting point because, you know, you talk, you talk about the, we talk about the idea of obviously the three year agreement that you even call the question in the book when, um, when Branch Rickey told uh, told Robinson that if he were going to do it, of course, he had to turn the other cheek. It, it felt like it was so much about what you ended up bringing to the table is, you know, it wasn't so much the fact that it was the agreement that he had with Rickey. It was the fact that, you know, Jackie had more or less his own internal code. And then obviously that kind of clashes sort of with him because you talk about the childhood stories about him growing up, he would be very defiant when he needed to be because he felt like as if, you know, if something was wrong, he would call it out, which is a, to me, a kind of an interesting, an interesting conflict, inner conflict for Jackie throughout his life. Oh, absolutely. And, and I was very cognizant in writing this 
something that struck with me, you know, with, with the passing of, of Martin Luther King last year coming up, you know, had its 50th anniversary. Uh, I remember one of the white leaders of the Southern Baptist leadership made the incredibly profound statement that, that you know, people remember Dr. King really well because he's been gone for 50 years. If he was here today, people wouldn't be quite so positive about some aspects of his message. And I think that's very true with Jackie. Jackie, in large part, is canonized because he's gone. So you can make him into this, this patient martyr. But the real man, yeah, he didn't mind to get a little bit belligerent. He, he was a political creature, uh, was very fascinated to talk about you know, there, there's a chapter in here about Pee Wee Reese, but one of the things I wanted to break off was to kind of compare and contrast Reese and Robinson, who had this really close relationship with Robinson and Roy Campanella, who were just night and day different, despite being two of the, uh, you know, first African-American stars. Uh, Robinson was very much offended by Campanella, who he just thought, kind of skated by and wanted to be everybody's pal. And, and in Robinson's mind, sometimes kind of shirked the social responsibilities that came with being a, a, an African-American leader in that day. So, so that whole dynamic is fascinating. And, and I've often wondered, had Robinson lived closer to 100, you know, what kind of scraps and scrapes he would have been in? I'm pretty sure there would have been some. Uh, and, and he might not be quite as easy to lionize today for people who, who really wouldn't care for some of the viewpoints that I think he would have come to espouse. Well, and unfortunately, it felt like as if we saw a little bit of that. I saw a little bit of that on social media the last couple of weeks, because obviously it being his 100th birthday, you know, his stance, obviously, from going back in the 1960s to backing, you know, the GOP, the, the Republican Party, you know, obviously, I think with the way the GOP is now, it doesn't necessarily reflect kindly on his past using today's context of the party with obviously his backing of Nixon at the time and his mm -hmm. subsequent run ins with guys like, um, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to think. Was it Malcolm I'm X? Of Malcolm X, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was trying. I kept on getting confused with um, the, what's his face, the leader of the Black Panthers at the time. But I was like, no, I think it was Malcolm X. Because I know they were definitely night and day in the same context uh, politically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you do you get this kind of sad, profound irony that that you know in 1947. Jackie Robinson is, is, is too advanced, too liberal, and you fast forward 15 years, and yeah, Malcolm X is calling him out for, he, you know, he did support Nixon, and, and Robinson later acknowledged that as a mistake and was something he wasn't very proud of. Uh, but he, he tried to walk into politics with his eyes wide open. He, he met Kennedy. He met Nixon. Based on what he knew of both men, he thought Nixon would be a little bit more progressive on civil rights. Uh, considering what went on with Kennedy, he later realized that he was wrong about that. But, uh, you know, it, it was a time when, uh, you know, you see it now all over social media. So, oh, just stick to sports. You know, there were a ton of people yeah. who were just saying, oh, Jackie, just stick to sports. Don't don't have an opinion about politics. But he never wanted to do that. He He was in it for the long haul for... You know the the uh, the African American community and the American community, and then was he perfect within that? Not any more than he was anywhere else. But uh, he never took the easy way out. And that's and that's definitely for certain. I mean, and it made sense, you know, in a way that you would have to pick a guy who would never choose the easy way out. I mean, let's be realistic. I mean, as you talked about it with Ricky, and as we've written a million times. I mean. If you were to look at a player in the Negro Leagues in the mid-1940s that you think, oh, well, this guy should definitely be a major leaguer on the basis of his, you know, his playing career, Jackie would probably be far from one of the first names brought up. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone always typically brings up guys like Larry Doby and being an Indians fan. I know Doby said many times that he could have never been the first player. He never would have been able to because he just never had that kind of um, that kind of personality or that kind of tolerance to be able to deal with that kind of hate. And even look at you know another guy who was his teammate on that you know on those Indians teams, Satchel Page. 
you know, without a doubt, Paige would not have been able, would not have been perceived by, you know, by probably white baseball fans as being too showy, being too much of a Negro League player to be openly accepted. And he would have been, you know, probably faced twice as much hatred towards him the way that, you know, a lot of fans had a hard time getting around on Robinson. Yeah, it's Ricky's choice was one that was the product of a lot of thought and and very much a strategy that he undertook in cooperation with the African-American press. Wendell Smith uh, gets a chapter in here, and it's this interesting kind of relationship where, you know, he scouts out Robinson, he finds Robinson, and then he uses Smith, among others, as a mouthpiece just to kind of make sure the path uh, to tell the African-American community you know, we've got to be careful how we do this. We all want this to succeed, so don't screw it up. Uh, and and Smith gets that message out. And, and Robinson, you know, he had to be a great baseball player. He had to be so many things. And, and one of the things that's interesting is how little training he had in baseball. I mean, Jackie was a phenomenal athlete, a great football player, a great basketball player. Baseball was far from his best sport. And we're talking about a guy who has less than a full season in the Negro Leagues under his belt when he signs uh, with with Montreal. So there was a gamble here in a baseball sense uh, with Robinson. Certainly you could have picked Amani Irvin or a Larry Doby or a Satchel Page who had the baseball chops uh, much more. But But Robinson was articulate. He was intelligent. He was college educated. He was a military veteran. Uh, there were uh, a lot of factors that went into the choice. And, you know, it, it always comes down to that that big dramatic scene, which apparently really was a big dramatic scene where Ricky and Robinson went through this one afternoon in Brooklyn, uh, you know, turn the other cheek, find a player with the guts not to fight back. Uh, and, and Ricky was smart in his selection, and Robinson passed every test he put in front of him. You know, and going and going on something that you touched on, like being able to be progressive. And one of the things, you know, and again, obviously with the focus on talking about the many lives, a lot of the book is set up on talking about Ricky trying to create the environment and letting all a lot of people know that this was going to happen and learning how to have them deal with it. The one that resonates with me was Red Barber. And, you know, you talk about someone who grew up in a, you know, far from progressive background in the deep south like Red Barber. That chapter, you know, really, really can open up a lot of people's eyes and seeing a guy who had such a large public persona in not just baseball, but more importantly, in the Brooklyn area, who is going to have to be one of the key guys in helping promote that idea with the Dodgers that red was going to have to be a guy who was going to have to truly embrace the Jackie mission, but wasn't necessarily on board at first. Oh, absolutely. And in this day and age, it's kind of hard to understand why red would be so important. People don't think of, you know, a radio play by play guy as that big of a factor, but obviously Red Barber was was special anyway. But it, given the era, that was the connection that most of the world had to the Brooklyn Dodgers. Red was the mouthpiece of the team, and, and what he said and what he observed was going to carry massive weight in the community. And yeah, Ricky sets him down in, uh, years ahead and says, "I'm going to do this." You know, there was no knowledge it would be Jackie Robinson. And Barber was absolutely gobsmacked and kind of stumbled out of the meeting, prepared to quit when one of the the secret heroes of the whole affair is probably Lila Barber, Mrs. Barber, who was a Southern lady who decided that she liked New York and she wasn't in a hurry to go. And and she said, well, honey, it's your decision, but let's let's have a cocktail first and let's talk about it. And, And my suspicion is that she knew, to steal a Lincoln phrase, the better angels of Barber's uh, you know, being would, would take hold, and they did. But Barber is so explicit in his writing about the mental process he went through, the way that he just sat down and reasoned this out. This ran counter to everything he'd ever known. But he said, I thought about it, and I thought, what what role did I have in selecting my parents? Obviously none. 
I happened to be born to two white people from Mississippi. It it was nothing that I did to make that happen. They could have just as easily been black people. They could have just as easily been from somewhere else. And that unlocks the whole key for Barber. He realizes what an irrational thing prejudice is. And Barber, among many uh, fine things about him, is an incredibly rational person. And, and Robinson just opens up this door in his mind and he walks through it and he never looks back. And the, the Dodgers love Barber. The Dodgers love Robinson. And, and the regard that Barber held for Robinson was an important part of the whole process. And, and Barber was transparent about how Robinson changed his life and how much gratitude he had for that change. And it's amazing to think that one of the key people in, in Barber's roles of really embracing the idea is his wife. Because going back to talking about Rachel, you know, I always felt that if there was one if there was one way that Jackie was going to succeed as a player in as in being able to help Ricky get this mission off the ground. And he, of course, mentioned it in his interview with Robinson earlier was being able to have a great support system in Rachel. I felt it was the most perfect person in Robinson's life to be that great support system. And we were talking about it earlier in, in this interview is the fact that she, it feels like that she was so much of a start of a starkly different person than you'd imagine someone who would be with Robinson because she felt like he felt like if she was fiercely independent, a lot yes. different from, from Jackie. And you almost think that that was probably her greatest challenge in having to, in having to be a part of Jackie's life. Yeah, to, to not be subsumed by this huge story. I mean, there, there are stories when she finished with her work back, back at school and, and excelled in the nursing field, in the teaching field, uh, that, that sometimes people would ask her, are you Jackie Robinson's wife? And apparently a time or two, it kind of took her back. And she, uh, uh, no, no, I'm not. Not that she was ashamed of Jackie, but yes, that desire to be her own person. Um, and she's done it so well. If there was anybody better suited to carry the torch for the Robinson legacy than Rachel, I don't know who it could have been. Uh, but it's there from from their first courtship. Rachel always brings something different to the table. She comes from a much more middle class background. Uh, you know, Jackie never really knew his father single parent family, very, very working class. Rachel comes from a much more respectable social place, and she carries this kind of class with her, which is very important to him. It's very important to the response to all the things that they had to endure. Uh, she is a remarkable woman. I, I reached out to her people to try to get her to talk for this book, and they just said, she doesn't do it anymore. You know, she's in her late nineties now. Um, but I, I did send her the chapter that's about her in the hopes that, you know, as I said, basically if there's anything I got wrong or anything that she would like to expand on, please, for goodness sake, let me know. I didn't hear anything back. Hopefully that's an endorsement and not a sign that she read it and thought, well, this guy's so far out of bounds that I couldn't fix it. But, uh, she Rachel is entirely worthy of a biography of her own, and and if uh, somebody wants to build off what I did, there's there's your jumping off place. There could be a heck of a good biography of Rachel Robinson, and you have my blessing, and I'll blurb for the back of the book, and and you know make it happen, folks. I really do not think that you you missed at all, especially on her chapter. I mean, it, it's early on in the book, and honestly, that was one of those things. I told you before we went on, you had me by the intro, and then with the first chapter being about Rachel, who I always felt that she was such an important figure, not just for Jackie's life, but honestly, I mean, you talk about you know reaching out to her people. I think she's done a, an amazing job, really helped maintaining Jackie's legacy, not just because, you know, she wants to be supportive of him, but honestly, I feel like as if it's because of her own independence in her own thoughtfulness of realizing how important, you know, keeping Jackie's legacy alive is. Oh, very much. And the, the things that Jackie Robinson Foundation has done, 
you know, to have an impact all through the the African American community. I look forward to the museum, which is going to be opened, I believe, later this year. Uh, I'm sure that'll be well done. Uh, but yeah, just it, it really it's a wonderful thing to be able to chronicle a marriage that was two completely different people, but together they brought out things in the other that they never would have found, you know, independent of that marriage. Uh, I set out to tell a story about a, a man and, and the social change that he brought about with the help of the people around him. And in many ways, I felt like uh, the, the, the truest part of the book probably was telling the story of a really amazing marriage. Joe, it's been phenomenal being able to talk with you. And again, we barely brushed the surface on all the different lives that you talk about. Again, pick up his book, A Fine Team Man, Jackie Robinson and the Lives He Touched. It's been published by Lions Press. Joe, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Seth. And, and anytime I do any of this, man, I, I have to give back credit to the subject. Uh, you know, I've written several things, but I approach this with a certain degree of reverence and, and whatever people take out of it. Um, you know, if, if you can hide me behind 42, you're going to do pretty well in the long view of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did an amazing job covering it. And again, the name of the book, A Fine Team Man, Jackie Robinson, and The Lives He Touched. Again, once again, Joe, thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoyed it. All right. Thank you.